So good afternoon. Uh, I'm from, actually from Somerville, Massachusetts. I know there's lots of Somerville's around the country. Charlestown, Massachusetts. What? Charlestown. My <laughs> husband taught middle school there for a number of years. So um, anyway, I know there's other Somerville's around the country, but if you are not familiar with the area, you are. Uh, Somerville is actually four square miles with 75,000 people. Um, so it's probably a bit rather densely populated uh, city. And it, it, um, in the east is a very immigrant community. In the west, it's right on the um, borders on Tufts University campus and has a bunch of college students and some of the professors. And it's a very blue collar community. Uh, last year, when the high school said they were going to have a multicultural fair, and they said you could have a table, but you had to come from the country yourself, not your parents. There were 45 different countries represented at the multicultural fair. So we get a real interesting group of students in Somerville, interesting community. And um, the way I've been working, uh, reaching out to the community is through the Somerville Mathematics Fund, which I founded in 2000. I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it so you have a sense of what it is we're doing, and I'll spend most of the time on scrapping. Um, we were founded in 2000 with a mission to celebrate and encourage mathematics achievement in Somerville. We're an affiliate of Dollars for Scholars, so we're a scholarship organization. And we give scholarships to kids who do outstanding work in high school and math. And the requirement is that you had to have done outstanding work. And as long as you're continuing to do good work, you have to have a B average in college and be taking either math courses or courses using math, we renew the scholarship for up to four years. Um, we also do teacher grants. $500 a year for teachers who have great ideas for the classroom but don't have the money to buy the materials. Um, family math nights. And the Scrap Heap Showdown. And I'll just tell you a little bit about these before we go on. In our first 11 years, we have given out $160,000 in scholarship money to 41 kids. And this is all donations. I am not intensely wealthy. Um, support from friends and community. We've given out almost $42,000 in teacher grants, and um, that's 104 teacher grants. And we do family math nights. <coughs> Some teachers use their grants for family math nights, either K to two or three to five. There were no schools doing family math nights. The first year we sponsored one teacher who wanted to do family math nights. She has renewed this every single year for the 11 years. And this year, five of the six elementary schools are doing family math nights in the two and three through five. So we're really, really excited that they're getting their families involved. Um, I do middle school math nights. We always celebrate five. And other things we've done in the past are things like a birthday party for Oilers, Tatter Night, Metric Day. And Pi Night is a celebration where we usually get 250 to 300 people show up to celebrate Pi. We have a lot of hands-on math activities that kids do related to circles and Pi. Some of it is collecting data that the teacher then uses in the class later. Other it is um, estimation is set where they actually go home with a drawing or they go home with a prize for their estimation skills. Um, Wait, I had the wrong <coughs> slideshow here because I'm going to go up and just go back. Uh, my apologies on this. I didn't want those slides, that slide in here. Hmm. It doesn't seem to slip. You know what, I'm going to continue with using those slides. Those are close enough to get us what we want. I don't know why they didn't come up the way I wanted it. So I'm going to apologize for that. I'm going to just go back to it. 
Now, leaving all the recycling, this is what happened. <clears throat> now, our annual high school engineering challenge, which we've held since 2005, uh, the Tufts University allows us to use their gym for this, which is very generous at Tufts University. Um, because you need to have space to hold a high school event like we do. Now, why did we choose Scrap? Someone asked me to give some background on why we did it. We used to do walks for Scholarship America. They, they ended. Those were fundraising walks. We needed to find a fundraiser that wouldn't compete with anything the other charities in town were doing. And I wanted something that would involve the high schools. So some of the dollars for Scholars Chapters telephone everyone in town. With 75,000 people in town, we can't do that. Um, there's already another charity doing a trivia night. There's someone else doing a hot dog and bean dinner or a pancake breakfast, a spelling bee. Any of those kind of things that are fundraisers, we can't do. So we had to come up with something else. So who did we ask for ideas? We asked the high school kids. And we invited a bunch of high school kids to come to a board meeting and brainstormed with us for an idea. And by the end of the evening, they were all convinced there was one thing we should do. Junkyard Wars. <laughs> I had never even heard of Junkyard Wars. As someone who didn't watch much TV, I had to try to figure out where it was on TV to watch it so I could figure out what it was they were recommending. Um, now, we have junkyards in Somerville. These are actually professional teams. The, the show I actually watched was a team from Disney Studios versus a team from Pixar competing against each other. And they were literally in a junkyard for a week building their machines and the machines. <coughs> it was wonderful, but I can't imagine that we could do that. That's a little bit beyond my ability in terms of liability. But that's what their idea was. We should come up with a junkyard war. And we do have junkyards in Somerville. We've got three or four of them that we could, but I can't imagine they'd want to do it. So we decided to create our own pile of junk. And this is sort of a sample of some of the stuff we've got. And here's another small sample of some stuff. And we needed to keep in mind where we were holding it. We were holding it on a gym floor. So you can't take the stuff from a regular junkyard. We needed to think of the safety of students. That's another reason why I wasn't going to put kids in the junkyard. It had to be portable. I had to be able to get my friends on the board to be able to haul it to the to tufts and haul it in. And then we not only collected a whole bunch of individual stuff for things, but we um, went and got uh, specialty things for for special projects. This is one year we needed ball bearings, another year we needed large paper. There was a printer that very nicely saved stuff for us in large paper. This year we needed electri electrical conduit and Roger's phone. Um, they donated the electrical conduit because they were rewiring the building. So they had lots of conduit around and they also gave us the phone to actually use. And I'll talk about that problem. You can see it was jamming in the junkyard this year. So what is what is scrap? That's our annual high school challenge. Students are given a problem to solve in their groups of three, a pile of junk, and three or four hours. They don't know ahead of time what the problem is. They put their teams in, together ahead of time. They do fundraising. They have to raise at least $75 a team. And we give prizes if someone can raise more than $75 to the highest fundraiser. Um, but it, we have never lost money on this. So it's not a big fundraiser, but we usually make between one and $2,000, which, which is not too bad as a high school fundraiser. It sure isn't good as um, when you look at price per hour put into it, though. The finale at the end is the students demonstrate their solutions to the challenges. And they're judged against a rubric, and the winners are announced, and prizes are awarded. 
Um, here we are setting up we, in the gym before we get started. And the question was, how do we create the problems? I'll give you a little background on the problems before I show you some of them. In May, we shift gears from evaluating scholarships and teacher grants and that kind of stuff, planning math nights, and we start brainstorming. What would be fun to do this year? What should we try? Anyone have an idea about something we haven't done and, and so forth? We come, up, we come up with a new problem every year. And then we play around with materials and see if it seems to work, and then we try some more. In fact, last year we played around until close to the middle of July with magnets, but we couldn't pull it together, so we came up with, with musical instruments instead. But we were, we were, um, we, we play with it. And that seems to be repeated ad infinitum. The board meetings change from formal stuff to hands-on about May and June. Then the board has a night where they change the board meeting over to the person's house who is storing the junkyard, and their board is given the problem to do it. we got to see that the problem A has a solution. Not the solution, but a solution. The students don't always come up with our solution. Most times they don't. And it has to be able to be fit in, in an afternoon. So that's why we, we do a trial run. But it also gives us a chance to revise the directions and to also come up with the rubric for judgment. And so board meetings starting in June through mid-October are very hands-on playing with materials. <coughs> then the board has to go out and find sponsors because we've got to buy prizes for the kids and hope to make a little bit of money when we finish. Okay, the, some of the challenges. We've had seven scrap heap showdowns and these are the four that I'm going to tell you about today. The Rube Goldberg Marble Run, the windmill, the musical instruments, moving on up and paper bridge. Now, the Rube Goldberg Marble Run, the challenge was they had to design a marble maze which goes between the far corners of two banquet tables held rigidly two feet apart. And there are bonus points for tricks performed by the marble. So if you can envision, you know, you've got two banquet tables, and we've taken boards that are all the same length and, and clamped them so the tables <coughs> don't move. And every team gets two tables that are clamped. They gotta drop the marble in here, and it has to be caught here, far corner to far corner. Can't touch it in, in between. You could just build a ramp from there to there. You don't get many points on the amount of time, because and you get trick, you get points if it can do tricks, such as doing spirals or loops or ride an elevator, a variety of things. So this one is actually a ski jump. If you notice, it just came down and jumped from there to there. And if you look at it, this is the ski jump. It came down this, it jumped through the hoop, came and caught here and then went through the path over there. We had a whole bunch of ski jumps that day. It was really sort of neat to see. Not everyone, but a bunch of them. Um, this one, if you look on your left, that's a loop the loop that the kid is, is building. The marbles went through. This one over on the right, if you look at this, it comes down this ramp and then underneath the table to here, which triggered this little elevator that took it up to the tabletop where it was supposed to end. Um, we also said if you could get it to go uphill, thinking going up an elevator or something, they came up with this model where it started up here, rolled up like that, rolled down, and then started down through its various other paths and tricks. Um, Couple versions of spirals. You've got points for how many 360 degrees turns you could get out of your spiral. Another year we did windmills. Now they had to design a windmill that was a working windmill which could turn on a light and raise a couple of pennies. And um, as you can see, the kids are sort of starting out different ways with this. But um, 
we weren't sure that the kids knew a lot about this. And so one of the things we sometimes do is we do background talks at the very beginning for five, ten minutes maybe. And this was one of those background talks where we gave them information so that they, first of all, knew what a windmill looked like and that they weren't all the same shape as the windmills you see um, necessarily now are, that are powering things around here, which all look the same, or the ones that you, you see on all picture, pictures of Holland in the past. Um, and so there, we had a variety of pictures of windmills, so they knew there was a variety to choose from. We also talked about how we were going to calculate the points because you had to put pennies in a cup, but there was going to be a relationship to not only how much weight it was, but how fast it was lifting up the weight. So there was a little bit of explanation on that. So they had some sense of what they were doing. And then they, then they went to work. And we have kids making different approaches. Uh, this is four different approaches to the blades. Uh, we have this team over here in the lower left that actually had vertical blades. And all the, the others in these pictures had horizontal blades. Blades were made of different materials. Um, if you look at the one in the upper right, they had four blades. And if you look at the one right below, they had quite a lot of blades more. Um, and you'll actually see those two at the end. Actually, you see three of those um, for a picture when we get to the end. Then at the end, we have the contest. And what we did is they were given a board to build their windmill on. And if you look here, this is the board that they had on their table. They built it on their, their own table and then they moved it to the table where they were doing the competition. We had two tables set up for the competition. So while one project was running, the other team could, next team could set up on the next table. So the fan <coughs> was the same distance apart from the blades and each of them, that's the part of the setup. And then over here, they had to hook their window up here to the pulley system so that they could generate the, first of all, the light and then raising the the uh, penny. So this is a picture of the cup part way up, the red cup part way up. <coughs> if you notice, here's the first one. The cup is down on the bottom, and it's coming up, and it's being powered by that. If you look on the right, you've got a vertical windmill. The next one has a horizontal windmill, and this is the one with the four blades. <laughs> and the women in back who are timing it are actually from a local um, wind power company called Second Wind. They came to the event and uh, cheered on the event and volunteered for the whole afternoon here. We were quite helpful. And then this last one, notice this one has far more blades. musical instruments. And what we said that they had to design and build more than one or more musical instrument, which can play a diatonic scale and a simple tune in the key of C. And we gave them a bunch of tunes to choose from and we printed out the music because we weren't sure that all the kids would necessarily know the tune. So we printed out the music and we did it both with the note names written above below and the 
the musical notes above. And if they could get their musical instrument to be automated, they would get bonus points for that. And if they could build more than one instrument uh, representing string, wind, and or percussion instruments, they would get bonus points for that. So this is the one where we, we thought we were going to take two and a half, three hours. The kids needed four hours for it, but just about every team was able to build three <coughs> So it was really worth the staying the, the extra time. Now this was a time where we gave them information. We had started out thinking we're going to do something on magnets, which I told you, but then we're zoning the group was saying, well, she really thought we'd do stuff with musical instruments. She was demonstrating at the board meeting with just basically cardboard and rubber bands, how much she could do with it. So we started thinking, I said, you know, I, I made a xylophone for my kids when they were little. I cut it out of plum plumbing pipes. That was 30 years ago now. They aren't quite so little anymore. Um, I'm going to pop it up on all my children now. But um, I remember reading how long each pipe should be cut. And, and so I basically had done it by measuring pipes and cutting pipes. And the kids had this xylophone. And I got it out of the board meeting. We were playing around with it. So I didn't have the measurements anymore. But we looked online. And sure enough, all sorts of people have directions for building the xylophone. And if you have this kind of pipe, you use this proportion, this, this, these set of measurements, and that set of measurements. And what we de decided was to do some experiments. So we sat at the board meeting playing around with cutting up, plum, plum, um, cutting up electrical conduit. And one of the, the board members had noticed that no matter what the different um, directions <coughs> were for all these different lengths in order to have middle C as your starting point, if you compare them proportionally, they seem to have the same proportions. And so we decided maybe it doesn't really matter what you choose as your initial length that you call C. And we tried building xylophones with different lengths as our starting point just to sort of prove. This is what we're doing at board meetings, is we're all cutting pipe. And it turns out that these proportions work as long as um, <coughs> you don't have someone who's you know, saying, this is the exact pitch for C. The proportions work so that it sounds right if you were to play it as a xylophone. So we gave the kids this information. And then we also said, what if you wanted to go down? Well, you could have. Um, that was going up an octave. This is going down from middle C. So we gave them the proportions going down. You could have actually just started and said, well, when you got to the, the top, that was your new middle C and gone up from it. That would have worked. But we figured it was just easier to give them the proportions for, for two. So we actually gave this in the paperwork that we gave the kids. Um, now, we had a bunch of percussion instruments made. And in this particular case, we have three different versions of xylophones. Come on in, sit down. You don't have to stand in the doorway. Three different versions of a xylophone. And you have one that looks more like wind chimes. And this one is actually pieces of wood cut proportionally. And then the other one looks very much like the xylophone I made for my kids when they were little. We had wind instruments. This kid in the middle figured out that if you started playing the pieces you would cut for the xylophone, you could play it as a pitch pipe. And so he had. Um, started playing it, and very soon everyone in the gym was trying to make pitch pipes. <laughs> <laughs> Except for the kid on the right who decided he was going to make his own recorder, which he actually did a pretty good job with. And then we had people also making various versions of string instruments here. Now, we had said to the kids that you get points for not only, you had to be able to play a scale, and then you got points if you could play a tune. Um, and you get, got points for automation. So we gave the kids choices 
the longest tune was the one that had the most points. We listened to Ode to Joy, Ode to Joy all afternoon. <laughs> because I'm not sure everyone knew ahead of time how to play that song, but by the end of the afternoon, I think it was in everyone's head because it was being played on the numerous xylophones around the room. It was really quite um, amazing to listen to in the gym as they were practicing. <coughs> they had to be able to play it for the, the competition. Now, the two winning teams were the ones that were partially automated or automated. The one on your left is the team that came in second. And if you notice, they have their xylophone um, built on little steps. So she could automate it to play the scale. So she dropped a wooden ball, and it rolled down, and she caught it at the bottom, and it played the scale going down. That's how she got the automation in that. And then when she played Ode to Joy, there were various parts of Ode to Joy that were just three notes in a row going downhill. And so she would play with one hand with the mallet. And when she got to any part where it was those <laughs> three notes going down, she'd drop the other ball and catch it and then continue playing with the mallet. She quite, got quite good by the <laughs> end of the afternoon of uh, playing this automated, partially automated um, xylophone. This was the winning one, the one on your right. This is Ode to Joy. If you drop a ball, a marble up there, each of those little pieces of wood going down is the same width but different lengths. He very carefully measured proportionally, and that plays Ode to Joy. So that, that was the feast uh, of Renaissance for the afternoon. We were really pretty uh, pleased with how well he had figured it, they had, they had figured it out. Now, moving on up was actually the one that was the hardest. We did, we were not necessarily expected <coughs> to be the hardest, but it turned out being the hardest. And this was two years ago. And they had to build a machine that would move individually a collection of marbles, bottle caps, cocoons from the floor to targets on a table. So they could load one at a time in the machine somehow, and it had to then get it onto the table. And it had to land on the table. And if you notice here, what we did is we had this frame that we moved around and placed on the edge of the table. And when it was time for the next team to compete, we picked it up and carried it to the next table. So this would, like if a marble landed on the table, they'd get credit for the marble so it didn't roll off. And then we had three cups that were their targets where they got bonus points for. And we decided we didn't want it to be just a marble race, because we had done marble races the year before. So we gave them a mixture of silkworm cocoons, bottle caps, and marbles to move, uh, figuring that would be an interesting collection for them to uh, try to transport. Now, here are the kids working on the problem during the afternoon. And as you can see, the construction sort of looks different as they're going along. And people approach the problem in different ways. And we had sort of four different approaches to the problem. This one in the um, upper left is These two go together. <coughs> they would load it here. They would drop the marble into the top. And then he would push it, and it was hinged. And down it would go, and onto the table. <coughs> and that was that team's approach to it. The one on the upper right was more like an elevator approach. And then a ramp to drop it down. The one on, on the lower left was more of a catapult approach to it. And the one on the upper bottom right was more on the elevator, but sort of catching it in the middle and then dropping it in. 
This was the winning team. They were pretty ingenious. You may notice, recognize them, because they were also the team that won the musical instrument and had the Ode to Joy this past year um, automated. And I think the kids were in the same t-shirt. He's changed in years, but um, his partner has a panda hat both years. Anyway, so uh, this particular machine, if you look at the bottom right, that's where they're loading it. And there's a little, and you can see cups here. These are individual elevators. And then they could load one piece at a time. So he would load one in the elevator, and one of the kids on the other side, in the upper left, would release the string for that. The counterweight would go down, and the elevator would be pulled up, and drop it in, and it would drop in at the top. And then if you notice, it rolls down the ramp, and the three elevators are aiming for three different targets. Each elevator had their own target underneath it. So they were dropping one right after the other right into the target. We also um, did building the paper bridge. We actually had chosen that activity because one of our board members who stores the scrap heap at his house and had been moving the material said, I can't deal with moving large, with large scrap heap pile this year. So we came up with something where he wouldn't have to move the large scrap heap pile. We decided, why don't we do something with paper? And so we gave them the problem of building the bridge. And the bridge was had to be a four foot span between two tables. They could use paper, string, and masking tape. We let them use um, <coughs> duct tape only on the table to attach it to the table. Now, originally, the other board member said, oh, let them use duct tape on the bridge. I said, no. I know these kids. They will game it. We will have duct tape bridges. We'll not have paper bridges. Um, and we were allowing them string. And uh, so and at the end, we <coughs> said, yeah, what's well, good? We didn't give them duct tape to, to use as the. But if you notice, um, we also gave the teams a road bed because what's with the bridge if you can't travel over it? And we had a little electric car that one of the younger brothers of one of the competitors drove around for us and tested out each of the bridges. So when the kids came in, they were they had two tables. They basically had if you look the supplies was what you see in the upper left, plus a big pile of string and paper, and everyone was given a roll of tape. Now, if you look at the setup in the lower right, you can see what we did. We set, this team had these two tables. The next team had the next two tables. So this team's table and that team's tables were touching. And so what we ended up with was the car <coughs> could start one end and drive all the way around the room over all the bridges. Now, could it drive over all the bridges? Yeah, everyone got the basic points for driving over the bridge, but it was really sort of a nice way to um, start the competition with the little car going all the way around the room and <coughs> people having a chance to cheer them on. But this gives you sort of a, a <coughs> picture of the perspective um, as they're still working there. And there was various different approaches. Um, a lot of very interesting, very beautiful string supported bridges, um, interesting superstructures and pillars and as you go along. And then we get to the car making it, its way around. So here's the, um, it driving the, the uh, little remote control car. Then we said that it had to support weight and we had a truck and we filled it with weights and we pulled it around. Each kid pulled the weighted truck over the bridge and you know everyone could pass that test. And if you notice, we have a um, yeah, uh, tape measure there because that was part of the next weight test. The weight test, the final weight test, 
was that it had to hold enough weights. The bridge had to support enough weights so that it wouldn't sink two inches. We told them that it could go down two inches, and that was we didn't we weren't trying to aim for breaking. We were trying, you know, if it dropped two inches, then that's we figured it's the maximum weight. And so we basically had brought all the weight to go into the hand weights that people can lift and so forth that people had around the house. We used up all of those and that wasn't enough weight for the last two bridges. And so now we're adding bottles of water to the hand weights on the bridge. And these are the two final bridges. The winning bridge was the one on your left. It supported 42 pounds. So, what's next? If you're in the Boston area, we'd love your help and expertise. We're always looking for great ideas. Definitely starting about May. Uh, if you're interested in working with me and my board, I would love to, to talk to you. If you live elsewhere, you'd like to do something like this in your own community, I'm happy to talk to people in uh, other uh, communities who want to do something like this. And because we are a 501c3, we have no paid employees. It's all volunteer organization, and everything we do is based on however much money is donated. We do accept donations. So, any questions? Yes? How do you vet the questions? How do you know that it's going to be something that kids can do which will be interesting and so forth? We try it ourselves. <laughs> Part of being on our board is starting in May and June, you're designing it for all summer, you're hands-on at the board meeting, and then when we get to September, which is a month away from the event, because it's always in October, we do a trial run, and we, it, we have to be able to build one of them within an hour to an hour and a half to know it's, it's doable. So that then allows kids extra time for planning and stuff. But, and the kids don't always come up with the same solutions. In fact, very seldom do they come up with the same solutions. But they, we have to have something that is solvable within that. <coughs> yes? Well, but, uh, who's on the board? Do you have kids on the board who actually know what's fun? Or you we have, have some people? people who have been former scholarship winners who are on the board yeah. who can give us feedback. Mm -hmm. Yes? Do you work with engineers? Because um, these are engineering projects. We, do, we don't have engineers on the board, although we do have one of our board members, and that's the person who is this wonderful source of material, um, is, is someone who is an architect who works on redesigning old band factories and that kind of stuff. I've seen some projects on triengineering.com, like the windmill is mm, okay. yeah, in the lessons part. That's a nice idea to check there. Yeah. It's called triengineering.com. Triengineering it's okay. quite popular among uh, engineering organizations like ICPA like and. Uh, yeah. It could be a, a source of other ideas because we play around with things. We had last last year we had two volunteers. <coughs> actually, one who is recently out of college with a degree in engineering, who's a volunteer, and she's going to be coming back again. And then someone else who was an apartment mate who had a degree in engineering, but now he's also doing a business major. And they were very into the magnets because they had done a bunch of stuff with magnets when they were in high school. And so what they ended up doing was um, they basically were with us through the whole planning. So we, we, did, we were getting advice from them as to how to approach it. But, but, um, it is an interesting adventure, because I definitely, you know, am not an engineer. I was a middle school math teacher from 1967 to 2009, so did hands-on stuff in my classroom, but I uh, don't have a background in engineering, and my background is in math. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes? Do you ever talk about the math that goes into it, and, and where do you have those discussions? We do some of the math discussions at the beginning, particularly if they need it, particularly when they're, when they're doing some things like the building the instruments and the proportions and that kind of stuff. 
because otherwise they might not have any idea about that kind of stuff. So we, if we really think that it's stuff that they haven't seen before, we do the first 10 minutes maybe of that once we get everyone registered and given them the problem they can look over the scrap of the problem. Before they can, they're allowed to touch the scrap heap, we do a little mini lesson on whatever the topic is. Any other questions?